Okay, so next is transduction. So I have transduction on this page. Okay. Transduction is a multi-step pathway with the addition slash removal of phosphate groups. Transduction is a multi-step pathway with addition slash removal of phosphate groups. This multi-step pathway helps to amplify the signal in the cell. So think back to the phosphorylation, phosphorylation cascade. So you start with one and it spreads it to two and they both spread it to, and, it, and it amplifies it. The original cell signal molecule is not physically passed. The original signal molecule is not physically passed. So the ligand isn't passed on. It just does its job like our badges to scan the uh, receptor on the door. That, that's its job. That's it. So the original signal molecule is not physically passed. It's going to relay or it's going to cause a relay of a chemical slash signal slash change in shape of a protein so it can pass on information. Original molecule is not physically passed on. It's going to create a relay. It's going to relay the chemical slash signal slash change shape of the protein so that it can pass on information into the cell. Phosphorylation often changes the shape of proteins. Phosphorylation often changes the shape of proteins. Phosphorylation means to add phosphate groups. Dephosphorylation means to remove a phosphate group. So phosphorylation often changes the shape of proteins. Adding phosphate groups, phosphorylation. Removing phosphate groups, dephosphorylation. This process of either adding or removing phosphate groups is used to regulate protein activity. So this process is used to regulate protein activity. Protein kinase, so it was an enzyme, protein kinase, it's going to transfer phosphate groups. I didn't want to write out phosphate groups. So I know what this abbreviation means. If you don't, then write it out. Protein kinase is going to transfer phosphate groups from ATP. The ATP can be reused the phosphate group or phosphate groups interact with amino acids, which change the shape of the protein to activate it. So protein kinase is going to transfer phosphate groups from ATP. That's going to change probably the ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate, into ADP, which is adenosine diphosphate. But that ATP can go back to the mitochondria and be, um, create ATP again so that it can be reused. So the protein kinase is going to take phosphate groups from ATP. The phosphate group or phosphate groups are going to interact with amino acids. That changes the shape of the protein to activate it. Protein phosphatase is an enzyme that's going to remove phosphate groups. Protein phosphatase. It's going to remove phosphate groups. That's going to inactivate the protein. Removal of phosphate groups are going to inactivate the protein. Transduction also includes small molecules and ions that act as second messengers. Transduction also includes small molecules and ions that act as second messengers. Second messengers are small. They can readily spread throughout the cell, so they can diffuse easily. That's that phosphorylation cascade. Second messengers are small. Those molecules are ions that are small, so they can easily spread throughout the cell. They can easily diffuse through the cell. So another beautiful drawing. So obviously this represents my cell membrane here, my phospholipid bilayer. Here is my um, embedded protein, embedded protein, the ligand, 
second messenger. This is my receptor. This is the second messenger. So whenever that ligand bonds to the embedded protein, it releases a second messenger, which then causes that phosphorylation cascade. All right, so that was transduction. Next is response. All right, so for response. Ultimately, a signal transduction pathway leads to the regulation of one or more cellular activities in the cytoplasm or nucleus. So the res response is a signal transduction pathway leading to regulation of one or more cellular activities in the cytoplasm or nucleus. So maybe the response from this whole cell signaling, maybe the response is to regulate protein synthesis. Do we want to make more proteins, increase protein synthesis, or make fewer proteins and decrease protein synthesis? So it might be the uh, end result is to regulate protein synthesis. So for example, you turn on or off genes. So you turn on genes, then they're gonna start going through transcription and then going through the process to make proteins. You turn those genes off, then they're not going to be transcribed and we're not gonna have those proteins. Another end result of this whole cell signaling, another response might be to regulate protein activity. So we have the proteins. It's not that we're trying to make them. It's we're trying to say, should this protein be active, yes or no? So for example, the ion channels, okay, we can regulate that protein activity. We can have those proteins open up so that the ions can move along their concentration gradients, or we can have those proteins inactivated so that they close, and then that ion channel is not allowing those uh, molecules to move along their concentration gradient. All right, so finally, there is a cell signaling diagram that can go into your spiral notebook, fold it over, a um, couple little pieces of tape at the top, a little piece of tape on the fold, and then I've got cell signaling on here so that I know that it goes along with it. Um, so it gives us an example. Let me move this up. It gives us a visual example. Here's our cell membrane, and so we can have lots of different um, embedded proteins. Some of these embedded proteins are going to interact with the um, ligand um, within the membrane outside the cell. Sometimes those um, ligands are able to move inside the cell. So each ligand is specific to the receptor. So this one's not going to activate this. It's not going to activate that. We need a specific molecule for each receptor. Sometimes the um, ligand is able to move, if it's small and hydrophobic, it's able to move through that cell membrane and it's gonna interact with a uh, receptor in the cytoplasm or in the nucleus. We have a cell signaling process that can um, create a phosphorylation cascade. So phosphate groups are added in order to activate and then we're going to increase that we're going to amplify that signal so that it can spread quickly throughout the cell. We have a few examples over here. Okay, so this is highlighted purple. So this is representing this purple ligand and this purple receptor. So a ligand bonds to a protein channel that opens the gate. And then we have a diffusion along the concentration gradient. I've got this worksheet, so you've got all that information. It doesn't want to focus for me. There we go. Okay, so this is purple, and that goes along with the purple ligand and the purple um, embedded protein. And so, essentially, what we're saying here is the bonding or the binding of that ligand changes the receptor shape and can activate it as an enzyme. Whenever that ligand is small or nonpolar and it's able to move inside the cell, so it can either activate something in the cytoplasm or it can go and activate genes in the nucleus. 
ligand enters the cell through passive diffusion because it's small enough to squeak through there. The ligand binds to a protein inside the cell. We have an activation of a signal. A good example of that is hormones. That's one of the ways hormones is able to act as signal molecules. Right. So next we have the green ligand and the green uh, receptor molecule embedded. So for green, a receptor binds to an embedded protein. A ligand binds to an embedded protein in the receptor. It activates internal molecule, or it sends a signal further into the cell. And so sending that signal further into the cell is um, like the phosphorylation cascade. So example of this might be a muscle contraction. We have a signal or a stimulation that causes the release of stored calcium, then that calcium goes on to create the muscle contraction.